Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was laying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am. And ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I, di I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not know yet that the Lord and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling us before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Our gospel lesson today comes from the sixth chapter of Matthew's gospel the 7th through the 15th verses. Listen now to God's word for us. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for their father, your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, this is different. Uh, admittedly, I don't know much about the Beatles. I know my mom has the first Beatles album. Her friend in Germany got it for her. Uh, it's worth a couple hundred dollars, I guess. But uh, I'll admit, the Beatles are much more her style than mine. Um, I'll also admit, no one has ever accused me of having good taste in music. Uh, for those of you who are in my generation, I'll give you an example. I'm pretty sure somewhere I have a Nickelback CD, and I saw Creed live in concert. Uh, so that probably would explain enough. I'm not ashamed of that, though. Uh, it's part of who I am. We all have our strengths and our weaknesses. Uh, this morning, we turn to the topic of prayer. And honest, honestly, I'm pretty sure that prayer is not a strength of mine. Sometimes I feel awkward not knowing what to say, not knowing exactly what to ask, wanting to say something different than what I always do, yet knowing that what I always do usually covers pretty much all that I need to get out there. There was a time when I would say I was a peripatetic prayer. Now, I don't expect you to know what that means. I hardly know what that means. It's a fancy Greek word that to say, I pray when I'm walking around. Uh, so in two weeks, when many of you uh, gentlemen are in the woods on the opening day of hunting season, uh, I want you to remember just because you aren't in church 
doesn't mean that you too can't work on being a peripatetic prayer. Uh, it's not unlike what I envision uh, Paul uh, meant when he said, be joyful always, pray continually. Given that this is Beatles Sunday, let me clarify, that's St. Paul. Let me clarify the Paul in the Bible. <laughs> I'm on board with, with living a life of prayer in that way. But for me, praying when I walk around, I know I say that as a bit of a cop-out sometimes because I use it to mean that I don't need to spend as much time in quiet, contemplative prayer just talking to God, listening as the boy Samuel did, as I probably should. After all, pray continually that's technically impossible. And pray continually has done a lot more to guilt me into feeling bad for what I haven't done than remind me of what to do. So, how do we infuse our days with prayer? A few years ago, uh, we had a church retreat on prayer, and I talked about uh, praying around a room doing a, a mental tour of your house or a room you know really well, and thanking God for, for the people in the picture on your wall, or uh, praying about that important event circled on your kitchen calendar. It's a good exercise. It's familiar. If you want to talk more about that, we should revisit that, I think. But Really, it might just be easiest to pray like Jesus. Jesus taught us to pray. In Matthew 6 is one place. He's talking to a mixed group of religious people. Among them were Jews who believed a person interacted with God by obeying a system of laws. Others were Gentiles, non-Jews. These guys, according to Jesus, were interacting with God as though he were kind of a good luck charm. Jesus said their prayers went on and on as endless rambling. What Jesus was doing when he gave that speech was not so much teaching people to pray as he was reminding them of something they had forgotten, that the Scriptures tell us we can relate to God in a personal way. It's about that perspective. It's not just about saying this or that. He does say, though, go into a room by yourself because God is willing to be intimately involved with each of us, to have a sincere relationship. It's not all about a show. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father knows what we need. It's not always what we want. The thing about a good father is they have their kids' interest at heart, of course. If God is fathering me, he knows exactly what I need, even when I don't get what I want. And when I don't get something I want, I can trust God didn't give it to me because it was not something I needed. It's not an easy concept, of course. I'd love ice cream for every meal, uh, definitely something I would have liked as a kid. I probably prayed for it at some point. But my father and mother gave me what I needed, not what I wanted. It's an act of love, of course. Jesus tells us God will provide what we need, even down to our daily bread. Now, you, you finish up the prayer with an admission of who does what in our relationship with God. For thine, God's. Not, it may rhyme with mine, but it's not about you. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Now, there's another way that you can begin to practice prayer too. And that's to listen, to sing songs, hymns and spiritual songs to God. It's been said that when you sing, you pray twice. And so, uh, if you didn't know the song, you'd see that we're going to be listening to a song entitled Imagine. 
you'd probably have no problem, if you didn't know the song, believing this was a song about prayer. Because prayer is, at one level, about imagination, about dreaming with God about what might be. But if you know the song, it's not as easy. John Lennon writes in one of his most well-known lyrics, the opening lines, Imagine there's no heaven, no religion too. Now, of course, when people heard that, even when people hear it today, they immediately close their ears and their minds to the possibility that what he's talking about has some use for Christians. This is a song for godless heathens, corrupting the youth, and all that stuff. Maybe it is. Probably not. You see, John Lennon was already under fire from Christians. He was famous for saying the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. Anybody who knew any of the news around that time heard John Lennon say the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. They lost 10 million fans over it in the United States. There are two things you need to realize about why he said that. One, he was right. For example, 52 million Americans are going to church this morning. More than that will be watching football this afternoon. In the context of this discussion, he was talking about young people in England. The Beatles literally had more fans in England than the Church of England had people. That was true then, and it's true now. The Beatles were bigger than Jesus. Two, he wasn't saying that was a good thing. He was making a point. And the point he was making in, in the interview was that the youth culture in England was not being reached by the church, but that something in the Beatles had really, really connected. I've often thought, you are apt to hear in a song what you want to hear in a song. Kind of like we hear in a sermon or a TV show or even a conversation, what it is we want to hear in those things. This song has been ranked as the third greatest of all time by Rolling Stone. Bob Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone was number one, which seems to me a little unfair. After all, Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone. But besides the point, Imagine is in the Guinness Book of World Records as the second best song of all time. It's been used for Olympics opening and closing ceremonies at least three times. It's been played at the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize ceremonies. It's been heard by billions of people during Live Aid, and it was played as a tribute to Lenin himself as the world was reeling from his murder in 1980, there's something in this song that clicked with folks. Where did it come from? Actually, Lennon explained he got the idea when his friend, comedian and activist Dick Gregory, who was the first black comedian to be interviewed on The Tonight Show with Jack Parr, when his friend gave him a Christian prayer book. Now, there's a man named Ray Comfort who's an evangelist. He's written extensively on the Beatles, the issues of faith, and he says in regard to Lennon that many have tried to press John Lennon into this anti-Christian mold, and it just doesn't fit. He writes, making Lennon's imagine into some kind of atheist anthem is taking the singer's words and his stated intent behind the song out of context. That's the general impression, and that's the wrong impression. Now, he makes a point, too, that for anyone who studied philosophy, it's actually a, a common point, it's a, it's a common way of arguing when it comes to classical arguments for the existence of God. Uh, the man writes that with the phrase... Imagine there's no heaven. You're actually implying that the songwriter believes there is. 
For example, if I said to you, imagine there's no New York, it's easy if you try. I'm acknowledging New York exists and then suggesting we pretend it doesn't. Lennon himself said in an interview that the song Imagine is a prayer, praying among other things that Christian denominations would stop infighting and all live as one. He said, the concept of positive prayer appeals to me. If you could imagine a world at peace with no denominations of religion, not without religion, but without this my God is bigger than your God thing. If you can imagine that, then it could be true. That's why Lenin wrote it. He says, yet there are atheists out there saying the song Imagine is the atheist anthem. Even when the composer of the song says, no, he wrote it as a prayer that Christian denominations would come together. Nobody seems to know that. And it's not even a stretch, right? It's from the band famous for peace, come together, and all you need is love. When we hear imagine there's no heaven, no hell, no possessions, we hear no anything to get in the way of coming together of sharing love freely, without condition, and maybe most importantly, without agenda, to view life as an opportunity to share rather than hoard blessings. If we're opening our hearts in prayer, we can't put any agenda we might have had ahead of what it is that we might hear from God. I'm not only asking God to meet my needs, I'm asking for a glimpse of what God's will might be. I'm not going to pretend that all of this isn't related to what Len talked about earlier. Today marks that we are six weeks away from our Stewardship Commitment Sunday, our Capital Campaign Pledge Sunday. It's an important step for our church community. It's one that puts us out there willing to take bold steps for the future of ministry here. It's a scary thing, and we need God to be in it every step of the way. We truly want what we are able to do for the glory of God to be revealed in prayer. See, it's not that we're counting on some aha moment in worship some Sunday, but that each of us, each of us will pray about how we might participate and listen to the little things about what it is that you are to do. Last week, I gave you a simple way to make the world a little gentler, a little more hopeful by learning to ask, how can I help you? What can I do for you? to the people you come in contact with every day. I asked if we could really imagine the kind of transformation the world and our lives would undergo if Christians everywhere would just ask that question, listen for the answer, and do it. This week, it's another simple concept, and it's just flipped a little. Instead of us asking someone else, what can I do for you? It's asking the exact same question, but to God. How can I help you, God? What can I do for you? Praying the same prayer that we've been encouraging for this entire season of generosity. Lord, what do you want to do through me? Ask that question. It's the same idea, opening ourselves to serve one another, opening ourselves to serve God. Can you imagine the kind of transformation that might take place if we just ask the question, listen for the answer, and do it? So you're invited to pray 
to think about what amazing and impactful ministry is in store for us here at Westminster. It truly excites me. And I've heard the same from many of you. So you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Amen.